Relationships. Um, what is right and what is wrong? And this is brought to you courtesy of Pure Matrimony, the world's largest matrimonial site for practicing Muslims. And we are today with our mashallah excellent guest speaker, renowned international speaker, Sheikh Musleh Khan. My name is Arfa Saira Iqbal and I am the marketing manager here at Pure Matrimony and inshallah I will be hosting today's call. Alhamdulillah, we're delighted and honored to have Sheikh Musleh Khan with us today. And for those of you who don't know already, uh, Sheikh Musleh Khan was born in the land of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, Saudi Arabia. Um, he grew up in Toronto, Canada, where he developed a strong love of basketball and was chosen as part of the starting lineup for five years in high school. He graduated as student council president in 1998 and he went on to pursue a diploma in computer programming analysis at York University which subsequently led to an acceptance at the University of Medina in 2002 to 2011. He spent approximately 10 years studying under various schools and acquired a broad understanding of Islamic sciences including fiqh, hadith, hadith tafsir and aqidah. Sheikh Musa is committed to spreading a message of simplicity and spiritual fulfillment by empowering Muslims with the knowledge and etiquettes in order to help them integrate into the broader community. He travels to many parts of the world including Australia, Europe and North America to deliver lectures on Islam and Islamic principles to a variety of audiences. In addition to this, he has also appeared on worldwide Islamic TV networks including Islam Channel and Ramadan TV. Sheikh Musa is currently the Director of Education at the Khalid bin Walid Mosque in Toronto where he conducts regular classes and lectures. He enjoys sports such as long distance running and basketball and loves reading and writing. Sheikh Musa is a family man and enjoys spending time with his family in Toronto where he and his wife reside. So Alhamdulillah, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over inshallah to Sheikh Musa and uh, hopefully inshallah we shouldn't have any problems now. Uh, please keep making dua. Um, okay. Asalaamu As Alaikum Sheikh, can you hear me? Walaikum salam. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. So I hope everybody else can hear me loud and clear. Yeah, I hope so, inshallah. So, okay. Um, okay. Never mind about the little hiccup, inshallah, but uh, let's get started. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much, Sister Arfa. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ba'd. Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, everyone. And welcome to another webinar, Halal and Haram Relationships. Um, this year is really exciting. Uh, over 3,000 of you are, inshallah, expected to join us for this webinar. So I am, uh, you know, specifically and personally very, very honored and excited about today's discussion, inshallah ta'ala. We have a lot of things that we want to talk about in terms of this topic. Very, very relevant, regardless if you're married or not. This is a very, very relevant topic for all of us. Even if you... Um, are just simply involved in regular lifestyle circumstances, go to work, go to school, just do your daily chores each and every day, this topic is applicable for you insha'Allah ta'ala because there's going to be a specific way that we're going to look at this uh, issue and then there's also a general way that any, per any person can also relate to the topic that we're also going to look at. So having said that, let's begin guys and you know, in all honesty, if we do have any hiccups during this discussion, it's a hiccup to be proud of because PM, MashaAllah, or Pure Matrimony, this is one of the webinars here that we have the most attendees ever. So it's actually a hiccup that we're very pleased about. But inshallah, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it easy for us and to give us the success and the tawfiq that we can get through this webinar and get through our discussion with ease and comfort and most importantly with understanding and hikmah. So let's take a look at the first slide. As you see here as part of an introduction in a society driven by lust, temptation and uh, immorality, the line between what is halal and what is haram is increasingly thin and distorted. So the issue here now that brings that comes to mind is how do we determine which relationships in our lives are halal or haram and where do we draw the line? So this is going to be the crux of what we're going to look at today, inshaAllah ta'ala. 
as we continue, halal relationships, a halal relationship, now we're just going to define the topic so at least we all have a standard understanding of what's going to be discussed. A halal relationship is one in which it is lawful for you to be in that person's company alone and have a physical contact with them because either A, they are your spouse and you are in, you are in a lawful marriage contract with them or B, they are forbidden to you for marriage. Islam has outlined exactly who our mahrams are and who have been made halal for us and Allah Azza wa Jal says. So now let's look at the foundation of uh, relationships and, and how it's mentioned and how it's spoken about in the Quran. This is perhaps one of the three or four verses in the entire Quran. There are also a few uh, mentioned in Surah Nur that talk about relationships between particular categories of people. Now here we want to look at this uh, verse very carefully because this is verse here brothers and sisters is the foundation of understanding who's halal for you as opposed to who's haram. What's interesting is look at the verse itself. It starts off by saying forbidden to you. You notice Allah is not going to talk about allowed for you are Allah is going to talk about the people who are forbidden. So naturally what's going to happen here is whoever is not part of these categories in this verse is automatically allowed for you to get married. So you see how you understand the verse? Whatever is not forbidden is of course allowed. Look at the first one Allah Azza wa Jal mentions. Now this is a verse here I'm sure many of us we've heard. حُرِمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ So we have forbidden for you in marriage your brother, uh, sorry, your mothers, ummahatukum. What does that mean? It means that um, every woman who was a direct cause of your birth. So, for example, your mom, your father's mom, your mother's mother, your mother's father's mother, etc., going all the way down. So, any mother who has a direct cause of your uh, birth. That's the first category, guys. The second category Allah is mentioning, wabanatukum, and every female that you were the cause of the birth of. So, your daughters, her daughter, your son's daughters, your son's son's daughter, and so on. Then it continues, third category, وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ And every female, or your sisters, so every female that has the same mother or father as you. Every female that has the same mother or father as you, or both of them as you. Then we have the fourth category, وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ Now here it continues. وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ um, So you have your father's sister. Now here your father's sister, every sister who is related to your father. So for example, your father's sister, your grandfather's sister, your great-grandfather's half-sister, it doesn't matter as long as it comes into that one uh, lineage. It's haram for you to marry. And every woman who is a cause of your birth, so the full sister, half sister, it's all haram. So just to keep in mind brothers and sisters, just so we all know, a stepsister of course is the same father but a different mother, whereas a half sister is the same mother but a different father. Then the next category mentioned in the verse, وَبَنَاتُ akhi. So the brother's daughter. Now the brother's daughter here of course is the full brother, half brother, step brother, their daughters. So again, it's your full brother, half brother, stepdaughter, it's their daughters. This is what the verse is talking about. And then the last category that's mentioned is وَبَنَاتُ ukht or the sister's daughters. And this of course is the same as the above that we've just mentioned to you. So you see how nicely the verse is put together. It just lays down a foundation. If you ever want to know who is permissible for you to marry and who is haram for you to marry, this is the verse that you want to come to. So once you know what's haram, you obviously know what is halal after that. As we continue to the next slide, the next slide, inshallah, let's get that going. Mm -hmm. There we go. The family. Now, the rules of halal and haram uh, relationships tend not to apply with family relationships. So here's the, here are a couple of the dilemmas or the issues we're going to look at. Mixing freely with non-mahram family members. For example, cousins, uncles, wife, aunts, husband, etc. Now here, the issue behind this is because they grew up with you, you guys just feel like brothers and sisters, 
just because you have a good relationship with somebody and they're they in terms of relationship why it feels like your dad feels like your brother feels like this or that that's not a reason to constitute or to make a relationship halal for you and that individual this is one of the traps of the shaitan to make something feel comfortable to make something easy for you that is in in, in and of itself haram one of the traps of the shaitan is to take sins and mistakes and beautify them for you because Allah mentions this in the Quran uh, the shaitan is going to beautify and decorate your actions to make them attractive for you and as a result you know what happens to people they end up falling into the mistake or the sin and here's, here's where the, the crooks of shaitan's trap is when you end up falling into that sin you can't see anything wrong with it so it's not restricted to just doing the sin but if somebody comes up to you and tells you look your cousin is haram for you you can't touch him you can't talk you know you can't have these kind of uh, relationships with him a person is going to look at you and be like you're crazy he's been like a brother to you he's grew up with you you guys grew up together since you guys were kids you guys are family you guys are this and that how could you say that about your family so what's happened to this person is the sin looked so beautiful to their eyes, they became used to it and can't see anything wrong with it anymore. Then the next dilemma that's mentioned here is removing hijab and modest clothing in the home, then physical contact such as hugging and so on, then that quote-unquote uncle who puts his hand on your head as a mark of love and respect, the brother-in-law, culturally they play an important part in the life with the in-laws and are often seen as important as biological brothers by the family. So you see you have a lot of cultural issues that also get uh, mixed into this whole problem. So here, remember that verse, it lays down a foundation, Allah makes it very clear, Allah just jumps right into the category, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He just tells us, there, these are the categories, haram for you, period, the verse ends this way. So these are some of the issues and the, and the problems that we deal with, with this particular problem. As we look at to the next slide, so we have the next slide here that's mentioned the family. The Prophet Sallam here also mentions it is better for a believer to be struck in the head with a hot iron rod than to touch a woman who is not lawful for him. And obviously this is an authentic hadith, one of the most important narrations when it comes to um, haram uh, relationships and people that are haram for you. So you see how strict it is? Look at the emphasis the Prophet puts on this, uh, on this issue. Just to set the record straight, prefer to be beaten with a hot iron rod than to touch a woman. Like That's how grave and serious this problem really is. And this proves that the physical contact of any type with any person who is not your mahram uh, is for, or forbidden to you for the for marriage is forbidden. So the, uh, the person who is not your mahram then obviously they are uh, to you they are uh, this is a marriage that is forbidden even if they are your relatives and even if you have the right intentions so it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you have good intentions behind them this is the whole issue here when a man and a woman are alone together then shaitan is the third so you see shaitan this hadith here what's interesting about it is that it shows you that this is one of the primary concerns that shaitan has when it comes to a relationship. One of the easiest traps that a shaitan can get access to and take advantage of that moment is when a person is alone with somebody of the opposite gender who is haram for them. As we look at the next slide, the brother-in-law. This is really, really important because here is where so many brothers and sisters get really confused and find it very very difficult to understand this concept now look at let's say, let's uh, uh, lay the foundation of exactly what the brother-in-law and what his role is in terms of a woman here it mentions that guarding against the brother-in-law has been specifically mentioned as the prophet ﷺ mentions the brother-in-law is like death for a woman what does this mean? We're going to look at this in a moment. The hadith clearly proves that your husband's brother or sister's husband is a non-mahram 
and that the rules of segregation still apply. So such a specific hadith for the brother-in-law tells us this relationship is more dangerous than with any other non-mahram and is a clear warning. So these are a couple of things you want to keep in mind when you look at this tradition. Number one, we don't have any tradition like this with a non-Muslim uh, person. We're talking about your brother-in-law. We're not talking about somebody who has no connection with you whatsoever. So whether they're Muslim or not, the point is they have no connection with you. This person actually does have a connection with you. This is your brother-in-law. There is some kind of or some level of relationship. But if the brother-in-law stays with a woman like his sister-in-law or someone else alone, then this Prophet Sallam compares it to death. Now, what this means is not referring to death in the literal sense. It's talking about death of the Iman. It's talking about your faith and your Iman literally will die. In other words, all of the temptations will start to fall in this particular um, in a circumstance as opposed to you sitting with a strange man. Just think about it. He's your brother-in-law. So naturally, a conversation will be there. Naturally, it's easy for you to talk to that person. If it was a strange man, you couldn't do that. It'll be very difficult for you to just simply start a conversation and get into something with that individual. It takes a lot more effort. But in this case here, because it's your brother-in-law, half of the work is already done just by them being a brother-in-law to you. So then as a result, it destroys and it kills the Iman in your heart. And this is why, Wallahi brothers and sisters, you just pay attention to it and see for yourself, you will find that the people who do this, who are very easygoing and very relaxed about this issue with their in-laws, with their brother-in-law or sister-in-law, you see for yourself that these people are of the weakest of faith and Iman. You'll never find a person who is praying each and every day, who, is, who fears Allah, who is reciting the Quran, who, who really, really has the consciousness that they need for their deen, you'll never find them being lackadaisical or easygoing with this particular issue. So keep that in mind, that the brother-in-law is like death you know, to your Iman uh, when he's with a woman alone. The next slide, uh, the brother-in-law as we continue. Now why? Because the brother-in-law, contrary to the stranger, can easily approach the sister-in-law and violate her privacy without people blaming him for doing so. So we talked about this. This is the reason why there's so much emphasis on the brother-in-law. Then culturally, now here's the next problem here, guys. Culturally, families find no problem with the husband's brother being in, a, in private with the husband's wife, which is why this relationship is so dangerous and haram. This actually here is not only a problem, but it's a barrier for people to understand this concept. Because imagine if culturally this is okay, it is very difficult for a guy like myself or another speaker or someone else to come along and say, look, this is haram. It's like trying to change something that's been engraved for so many years, for, for so long. And there's not just one family doing this, there's a whole entire culture and people that's doing the same thing. How can you come and say that this is wrong or this is haram? So it, becomes, it actually makes things a lot more challenging in that sense to try to convince an individual about this. Then the next issue is that death here refers not only to physical temptation, but to the mischief that could be caused due to gossiping and manipulation of the sister-in-law or of the husband. Very, very dangerous, guys. Keep this in mind. A lot of um, the brothers and sisters, you've been asking me this question a lot about the brother-in-law. Don't try to look for any loopholes, guys. Don't try to look for any way out of this. Just, just keep this as the way Allah Azza wa Jal tells you to keep it. They are a stranger to you, and this is what Allah deems as the final result. However, I think it's important for me to make one point here. Even though they're your brother-in-law, it doesn't mean that you cannot be nice and kind. You shouldn't be courteous. You shouldn't be, um, you know, caring and things like that. But just remember, all good things also have to be controlled and they have to be moderate. So just because you have your brother around doesn't mean that you can't reply to his salams, or it doesn't mean you can't talk to him. It doesn't mean that you can't ask him, like, oh, you know, can you pass me the orange juice or something? You know, it doesn't mean like you cannot say a single word to them. No. That's not what the Sharia intends here. The Sharia, its asl or the origin of the Sharia is to bring ease to a situation. 
So you have to use your discretion and you have to be moderate and you have to be courteous and you have to have guidelines in how you do things. You have to make sure you follow the morals and ethics of your deen and inshallah this will be easy for you. I have sister-in-laws, I talk to them, I have a good relationship with them but I know my limits with them and they know their limits with me and we know that we don't hug and we don't shake hands and we don't do anything like that but we still at the end of the day are kind and courteous, friendly to each other just to keep up and maintain that normal natural relationship that you should have with the general people. The next slide as we continue, uh, well now we come to the workplace. So this is more of a gen general way to looking at this whole halal and haram relationship issue. Now generally, the non-Muslim workplaces, there's a lot of complications such as shaking hands and working in a social environment, going to you know meetings, working on projects and assignments, uh, trying to accomplish a particular job where it involves other people of the opposite gender and things like that. So here, is it okay to shake hands with your colleagues in a professional uh, capacity only? Now some of the modern day scholars, they say that this is okay. But whether it is for professional or personal reasons, the Islamic rulings are always the same. Touching of any kind is not allowed. Your intention is irrelevant. Now the best of mankind, the Prophet ﷺ, did not touch a woman nor the, saw the need to do so. And this is despite the fact that the oath of allegiance was originally given by hand. Now let's pause here for a moment. Let's just look at this thing in a more practical um, scenario. Now imagine somebody does come to you and they do want to shake your hands. What are you going to do? What do you do at this particular moment? The, the, the man comes up to you or the woman comes up to you and they stick their hand out and they say, hello, nice to meet you, my name is so-and-so, and they want to shake your hand. How do you deal with this? I'll give you a couple of tips. Number one, number one, and this is not number two, three, or four, this is number one, be honest, guys. Be honest, be courteous, be kind, be gentle, and just explain yourself. I'm sorry, I really, really apologize, but I just can't shake your hand because of religious reasons. Or my religion tells me that, or, you know, that I can't do this. Just be honest and be kind. Very, very rarely, if not never, do you need to go to a second choice. If you are honest from the very beginning, then inshallah, if a person is an honest person themselves, they're a person that's kind, they care about you as well, then inshallah this is not going to be an issue for them, they're going to accept it. But if not, then clearly that indicates to you what kind of individual that you're dealing with as well. So that's the first thing. But if let's just say that doesn't work or you, you're not, you can't do that or you just don't have it in you to just be honest, then try to do little things. Like try to keep your hands you, you know, busy with something else. You know, you can even pretend that you're on the phone or something. You can pretend that you're texting, whatever. Try to find, use your imagination, just be creative for that little moment and, um, you know, try to just create that barrier. Yeah, I remember one sister once told me, she says, I don't really encourage this, guys, but I mean, I'm just going to throw it out there anyways. One sister would tell me that every time she was faced with that circumstance, she would sneeze in her hands and just say, oh, really, I'm sorry, sorry, I can't, I can't shake your hands. Now I'm not saying you know don't don't sneeze in your hands because then you're gonna spread germs in your hands and not worry about the other person. But uh, at the same time, you know, just use your wisdom and try to figure out little ways that you can get around this particular issue. Now, in terms of the um, the workplace, as we continue, Aisha radiallahu anha said concerning when the Prophet sallam would take the allegiance from women. Now look at this, and this is one the, the allegiance that she would take for, he would take from the women. And no, I swear. By Allah, the hand of the messenger never ever touched a woman when they would give him allegiance, except that he would say, I have taken your allegiance upon that. So this just emphasizes the fact that the Prophet ﷺ never touched a woman that was haram for him. Then Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anha, radiallahu anhu, he mentions the Prophet ﷺ never used to shake hands with a woman in taking allegiance. Then, despite the fact the Prophet ﷺ was the most honorable of mankind and would have had the purest of intention, he still never shook hands. So you see at the end of the day, guys, it doesn't matter. You can still be a great person. You can still be a kind and friendly individual. And you can still avoid 
falling into these haram circumstances. As we continue in the next slide, uh, the workplace. What about working in social um, conferences um, where alcohol would be consumed and there's free mixing and things like that? Here, of course, you need to weigh up how important the event is uh, for work and how much of it is work versus a social event. Now, the, the hustle guys or the origin is or the basis is that it's better for you to avoid such events as they usually are a source of fitness and other things like free mixing and alcohol and so on, all of this contribute to that. So the reality is, is that you want to try to avoid this as best as you can. Set that in your mind. Make that your foundation. But let's say if that's um, difficult for you to do. If it is necessary for you to attend for the sake of work, then fear Allah Azza wa Jal and attend. However, it is not permissible to sit at the same table where alcohol is being served or engage in unnecessary free mixing. So, the point here is, guys, you know, there is a solid, real, acceptable sharia reason. So work is a good, solid reason. Because of your job, you may have to sometimes get your hands dirty and do things that you don't want to do, but just to create a, or to accomplish a greater good for yourself. Then the sharia um, uh, accommodates this circumstance. And the sharia makes it easy for us as well to deal with these circumstances. So you go to it. But just remember, at the end of the day, follow your morals, follow your ethics, follow your deen. It's just like, you know, guys, you know, when you go to university and you go to college, you go to high school and all of these different environments, you're faced with the same thing. Now, a sheikh was once asked a long time ago, is it permissible to study in college and university where there's free mixing? Guess what the sheikh says? The sheikh responds and he says, no, it's haram. It's haram for you to do that. So this brother, he was, he was, a, he was a very intelligent brother. So he used some wisdom and he reworded the question in a different way. And he said to the sheikh, he said, yeah, sheikh, uh, is it permissible to study in these environments? But then at the same time, you're studying something that will benefit the Muslims. And then when you're in these environments, you'll make sure that you follow your deen. You pray five times a day. You'll, you know, you'll, you'll limit your conversation and your free mixing with others and things like that. Is it permissible for us to be in this environment in this case? What do you think the Shaykh says this time? The Shaykh says yes and he also includes, he says yes and it is recommended for you to do this because at the end of the day you'll educate yourself. See what it, mean, what it is guys? This is why the Prophet ﷺ once said, fear Allah wherever you are. Ittaqillah kun. Fear Allah wherever you are. Fear Allah when you're at the workplace, when you're in a gathering, when you're in school, when you're standing, sitting, walking on the sidewalk, on the subway, wherever you are, just always be conscious that Allah is watching you and this should be your ticket to handling all of those situations. As we continue, uh, the boyfriend and the girlfriend issue. So what does having a boyfriend mean? Is this relationship recognized in Islam? Now, of course, it's not recognized in Islam because Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَلَا مُتَّخِذَاتِ أَخْدَانِ And then in other verses, وَلَا مُتَّخِذِي أَخْدَانِ Now, um, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَا مُتَّخِذَاتِ أَخْدَانِ So don't take a male or a female as friends. What Allah is talking about here is talking about boyfriends and girlfriends. That's the verse that this is referring to. Um, that's the thing that this verse is referring to. So clearly it mentions that this pre-relationship uh, that you have before marriage or just, you know, a nice social relationship with two people, boyfriend, girlfriend, this is completely haram in our religion. It was never allowed ever. How many times have you heard or said, we're only, we're only meeting up or we only talk on the phone or video chat? Well, that's the, that's the way things start. You know, shaitan doesn't always bring things faceful or just doesn't bring things at a large scale. Sometimes the most dangerous things that you deal with in your life start off at a small scale and work their way up at, to bigger and larger problems. Just think about it, brothers and sisters, when you're in a marriage. If you let a w certain habits that your spouse does that they, that you don't approve of or you don't like. So for let's say for example, 
like your husband, he doesn't pray on time. But he prays five times a day. But he just doesn't pray on time. He prays all of his salah at the end of the day. He'll pray dhuhr, asr, maghrib, asha all at once. Now, if you happen to be content with that, I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you it's almost 99% of the time a person like this will miss some prayers. There will be some days where they'll just get too lazy and they'll just miss a few of those prayers because it becomes overwhelming. All of his prayers is done at once. But the problem is, is that as the spouse, if you leave this and you ignore it, then what it did is that it left, it led now to that person leaving off a couple of the salah. If you ignore that, then it eventually leads that person to not seeing any ihtimam or any importance to the prayer in and of itself. Same idea when it comes to this. If you just talk on the phone with somebody, if you're just chatting away, it's no big deal, you know, you just have an acquaintance, well, guess what? That's how things work. That's how a, a, a great problem begins. It starts off with the little things inside. Like, so brothers and sisters, what I want to say here is don't expect to lose all of those, uh, uh, sorry, don't expect to lose all of those small problems and then expect to win at the grand finale. So don't expect that you're going to lose by talking on the phone. You're going to fail by doing the video chat. You're going to fail by having these acquaintances and getting into haram uh, uh, relationships. But when it comes time and shaitan brings you to the point where you're alone with this person and one thing leads to another, don't expect yourself that you're going to be able to overcome that if you've been doing all of this in, uh, before. So you see what I'm saying? Don't expect to win or to, you know, to lose at all the small things and then win at the grand finale. Then, this is exactly the point. Look at the third bullet. Dangerous as it starts off slowly, eye contact, phone calls, etc. As time goes on, and, um, the guilt wears off, becomes comfortable enough to justify your action. So in other words, you start getting so relaxed and comfortable with it that you try to look for all the little loopholes all of the little loopholes to make this happen because why it's really good now and then shaitan encourages you to keep moving to the next step then you ask yourself this at, at which point do you draw the line where do you stop boundaries become so blurred that what is haram and halal is not clear anymore and keeping with this famous arabic couplet states a look then a smile, a nod of the head, then talk, a handshake, a promise, then the warmth of, and then it continues, you know, subhanAllah. So all of these things, you know, eventually it leads to these kind of issues. And then the warmth of the bed. So, you know, it clearly just emphasizes the same point that we're talking about. Little things lead to larger problems, so try to avoid the smaller problems. Allah will protect you from the larger ones as well. As we continue, brothers and sisters, to the next uh, slide. So same, we're at the boyfriend and the girlfriend uh, issue. Here now, Islam uh, is prevention. Islam is a prevention. So in the prevention is better than the cure as it removes any doubt or gray areas from the situation and closes the door of fitna and temptation from the outset. So this is the beauty of the Sharia and the purpose. Don't get close to something and inshallah it will protect you from all the greater things. Allah tells us don't drink in the Qur'an. Allah doesn't tell us don't get drunk. Allah tells us in the Qur'an don't commit zina. Allah doesn't tell you don't look at the woman or don't do this or don't do that. Allah tells you don't do those greater things and then Allah also Azza wa Jal, He also tells us sometimes, you know, depending on the situation, all the little things that lead to that. Allah will say don't get close to zina. He doesn't just say, or not, some verses they do say that, but they have a certain context behind it. But Allah Azza wa Jalla, when He says, don't get close to zina, it clearly is indicating all the little things that's going to lead to it. That's what I'm talking about. The Prophet also mentioned here in a, in, a, in a really, really beautiful hadith, any share of fornication of the son of Adam is written and no doubt he will reach it. The fornication of the eyes. So the fornication of the eyes is looking at that which is forbidden. The fornication of the ears is listening to that which is forbidden. The fornication of the tongue is saying that which is forbidden. The fornication of the hand is grasping that which is forbidden. The fornication of the feet is walking to that which is forbidden. And the fornication of the heart 
yearns and desires as and the genitals either confirm it or contradict it. So this hadith, subhanAllah, is, is such a comprehensive hadith. I'm sure every single one of us can somehow put one aspect of this hadith into perspective, either an experience that we might have done, or we know somebody is doing, or something that we have seen and heard of. This is the time that we're living. It's just amazing. Over 1,400 years ago, a man spoke about this and spoke about it in that much detail, subhanAllah. As we continue, in the next slide here it's mentioned is that, okay, let's just pause here. There we go. The hadith uh, tells us it's not okay to just hold hands or just talk or on the phone for hours to a non-mahram. It still counts. So here we're going to look at some of the benefits of the hadith. It still counts as a form of zina. Uh, or fornication, so it must be avoided at all cost. Uh, therefore, to have a boyfriend or girlfriend in Islam is a very Western concept and is haram. This is a very real disease of modern society brought up by the lack of belief in Allah and therefore the religious institution, institution of marriage. Now, I just want to pause there. That fourth bullet that we just read there. Now, this is the very real disease of modern society brought on by the lack of belief in Allah or in God. Now, this is the crux of the matter here. If a person falls into these problems, it means you have weak iman. It means that you don't know who Allah Azzawajal is. It means that you're a person that you don't have that relationship. You don't know who you're worshipping. You might just be doing the movements, but it's just simply not enough. It clearly shows here Brothers and sisters, if you want to overcome these issues, you have to know who Allah is and what His presence is all about. Allah is a witness to all of us. Uh, what, what does that mean? It means that Allah always has the knowledge of everything that we're saying and everything that we're doing. It means that Allah is always aware. It means that Allah is looking at you each and every single time. Allah even affirms this in the Quran and He tells us that He has the key to the ghaib. He has the key to the unseen. وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ And then he says, لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُ No one will understand the knowledge of the unseen except him, Allah Azza wa Jal. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ Allah knows what's happening on the lands. He also knows what's happening at the depths of the ocean. He knows what's happening underneath the rocks, beneath the bottom of the ocean. And then Allah also continues and he tells us, and he knows وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا Allah even knows when one single leaf falls from a tree. He knows when it's going to fall, where it's going to fall, how it's going to land, the speed that it's going to fall at, the method, the, the, every little detail of how that one leaf will fall, Allah is aware of this. Now the question is, if you think that Allah Azza wa Jal knows that much about His creation, and of course Allah is very well and watching that individual who's doing the things behind closed doors, who's doing the things where nobody is watching them and falling into that haram, of course fear Allah Azza wa Jal. This is the crux of the problem why people fall into the, the boyfriend-girlfriend thing. The main purpose of nikah is to make this halal for you, to give you a halal relationship. Uh, so there is no need to continually commit zina with a boy or girlfriend when Islam gives you a simple and halal option of a nikah. So go for that. You know, use that halal option. Use the opportunity to do that. And by the way, brothers and sisters, there's even a nice practical way of looking at nikah relationship as opposed to a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. A boyfriend-girlfriend relationship is so dry. Whereas a nikah, an actual marriage, it just means that much more to you. Imagine this is your wife, this is your husband. You'll go and comb the entire earth just to protect that person. You'll buy them everything you, you can just to make them happy. You'll work and you'll strive to do that. It's very rare that a person can do that for just a boyfriend or just a girlfriend. And even if they can, it's limited. It only lasts for a certain time. I mean, how many people do you know, brothers and sisters, that are in these kind of relationships that actually last a lifetime? 
how many people do you hear about it? It's very, very rare. It's extremely rare for something like this to last. Whereas just to ha being part of the institution of marriage, it just brings that much more finesse, finesse, that much more commitment to that relationship. And so you work hard to make it work, and you work hard to keep that commitment as long as possible. So try to always keep that in mind when it comes to the beauty of the nikah. As we continue, uh, the next slide here, it mentions the friend. So we're looking at a more general circumstance. Now this has become increasingly common to have friends of the opposite gender. The term friend meaning different things. Um, most friends are made at school, college, university, or any other social gathering. Since we've already established that the unnecessary free mixing of the opposite gender is a means to fitna and is therefore haram, what do you think about the friends? And then in addition to that, it is the easy area to fall short. Boundaries break down gradually and shaitan helps you justify the, nation, uh, the nature of your relationship. So, the friend. The Prophet ﷺ says, very, very clear hadith, you are on the deen of your khaliri. You are on the path of your friend. Now listen to the wording of this hadith. It's absolutely incredible. The Prophet ﷺ uses the word deen. Deen, we know, means religion. What does linguistically the word religion mean? It means a path or a method that you follow to do something. So the Prophet Sallallahu that's the first thing, he uses the word deen. What's another connotation about this word deen? A second connotation, a second aspect to it is that deen is something or religion is something that you commit to and you put an effort to make it work. So this kind of relationship, you're actually going to find yourself that you'll, you'll try to find every loophole to make it work, to justify that it's okay. The third thing is that in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he also says that he uses the non-definitive form of the word. He doesn't say ad-deen with the alif lam, but he says just deen alone, so it's non-definitive. In Arabic we call this nakira, and that just basically means it doesn't matter what the habit is you're following with that friend. It doesn't matter if they smoke, if they drink. It doesn't matter if they have boyfriends or girlfriends. It doesn't matter if they, they fear Allah or not. It doesn't matter if they're this or that. The point is, if they're your friend, then you're going to be influenced by them. It's natural with anyone. It's true with any person. So if you want to be a good person, try to have good friends. And if you don't want that, then the friend is going to define who you are at that point. So just keep that in mind. Extremely important point. As we continue with the next uh, slide, the friend, there is no such thing as a platonic relationship with the opposite gender. Temptation, bad thoughts are never far away. So you can't just be like, you know, just friends. You know, we're just going to have a good relationship. We'll see each other, right? go out to a movie, go out for dinner, do this and do that. You can't have that. And if you have to do um, group work, you know, for example, presentations with members of the opposite gender, then keep it to the work in hand. In other words, just focus on the job and get the job done. Being respectful and friendly is not the same as just being friend. The Prophet ﷺ says a person is on the religion of his companions, therefore let every one of you carefully consider the companion that he keeps. So here clearly, brothers and sisters, if you have a job to do, get it done. If you happen to be in university or college, you've got an assignment, it's a group assignment, get it done. Be courteous, be kind, but focus on the goal, focus on what needs to be done, and inshallah, ask Allah to make it easy for you, and that's it, and then you just continue. If another posture comes up, that's fine. The Sharia makes these things easy for you. And so, inshallah, as long as you follow your deen, inshallah, things become easy for you. Let's continue. Um, the fiancé. Now here, the, the Western concept of an engagement is very different to the Islamic concept. The engagement in Islam simply means that when the man asks the woman to marry him, Allah Azza wa Jal says, and there's no sin on you if you make it a hint to be betrothal. Now, betrothal, of course, the engagement we're talking about. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي مَا عَرَّبْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ خِطْبَةِ النِّسَاءِ So there's no problem for you, there's no sin, there's no harm if you just at least hint that you want to engage to that person. Engagement in Islam just simply is an agreement, brothers and sisters. It's an agreement that you're saying to yourself, look, I'm going to commit to you, 
and uh, you know I have an intention to marry you and you have an intention to marry me so therefore what you've done now is you've closed the door for anybody to come and ask for you in hand of marriage it is haram and forbidden that if you are engaged with somebody to entertain any other engagements you're committed to that one person so you cannot just say okay I'm engaged to like four people and I'm still deciding who I want no be engaged to one person and then see if that works if it doesn't work then inshallah you can be engaged to someone else also the Prophet Sallallahu uh, he was himself engaged to Aisha radiallahu anha and there's no harm in being engaged as long as you don't introduce haram practices like exchanging of rings now just want to pause for that moment here because I get asked this question a lot about the exchanging of rings exchanging rings is only haram if you feel that that is the barrier between you and your engagement if you feel that, look, we're not going to be engaged until you get down on one knee and you propose to me and you say, you know, look, my darling, will you marry me? If you do it like that, then obviously this is the haram practices that we're talking about. This goes back to that one hadith that we, or many of us, we know, that the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever imitates a particular group of the, in terms of their culture and things like that, then you become a part of them. So giving the rings for that particular purpose, of course, is haram. A ring doesn't define a relationship. It doesn't make a, uh, a, an engagement happen. However, now this is the point that I want to get to. If you wish to just give each other a gift, then that's fine. There's no issue with that. The sharia doesn't have a problem with that. The problem is your intention behind this particular gift. If this is where the issue is. So you just need to make that very, very clear. And insha'Allah, that is going to be uh, fine and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. As we continue, culturally a lot of families think it is okay for a man and woman to go out alone and be together once engaged. However, this mentality is as damaging as having a girlfriend and boyfriend. Brothers and sisters, I can't tell you enough. I can't tell you enough how many times I have done weddings where I've gone to the wedding ceremony and I'm going to perform the nikah but just before I perform the nikah you'll see the bride and the groom he'll come he and she will come down and they will hold hands and they will hug each other before the nikah even started and that clearly just painted a picture for me that wait a minute I guess they were under the, the assumption that just because they were engaged that this was all okay just because you're engaged doesn't make anything halal for you. You are allowed to speak to the person as long as you follow rules. So as long as you follow rules, what do I mean by that? The halal of it is halal, the haram of it is haram. I've mentioned this in past webinars as well. You can talk about an issue. You can talk about building a life together. You can talk about, well, what's your plan, in, you know, for inshallah when we get married? Where are we going to live? When is the wedding going to be? How much are we going to spend? You're allowed to talk about these issues with each other because these are important issues that need to be discussed. There's no way to get around them. So you have to discuss those things. But if it's just like, hello, how are you doing? Oh my gosh, you look so handsome today or you look so beautiful today. These are the problem. A lot of cultures encourage this. And this is really unfortunate because this also is one of the reasons why um, marriages become unsuccessful. Keep that in mind, brothers and sisters. One of very important usul al principle that if the method you use is wrong, then the result itself will also be wrong. So if the method that you use to accomplish a good is in and of itself haram, then guess what? Even if you do accomplish the halal at the end, you're still going to have problems. Allah Azza wa Jal will still test your relationship and cause problems to happen. So you need to think about that as well when you get involved in a relationship. This relationship is hard to control as the opportunity for sin is greater. The mindset of we're getting married anyway, so it's okay. It's just an in a way, inappropriate way to ju justify, just, justify this behavior. It's the hybrid way of getting around this whole thing. However, the only point at which it is ever okay is when you are married. Before that, you are still strangers, so the rules of non-mahram still apply. In other words, just because you're engaged, it can be broken at any time. It can be broken at any time. The guy or the girl can just say to each other, look, I don't want to be engaged to you no more. Salaamu alaikum. It's done. Period. So that's important. Next uh, um, slide. 
the non-biological family, this refers to the stepfather, stepdaughter, adopted children, adoptive um, parents. In terms of the stepmother, once she is married to your father, your stepmother becomes permanently forbidden to you for marriage and you become her mahram. So this is very, very straightforward, guys. So this is the information here for you so you understand what category these individuals they fall under. Then the stepdaughter, you become a mahram for your stepdaughter after the marriage contract and consummation of the marriage to your wife has taken place. So you become a mahram for her. In other words, you're responsible for her, you have to take care of her, you have to do all of those things for her, inshallah. Next uh, slide, it continues. Uh, the adoption issue, a complicated matter. Child needs to be breastfed by the adoptive mother for a relationship to become lawful. Um, if the child has not been suckled, then it's as if non mahram as if they were non mahram to you. You are a non mahram to them. So it's the same back and forth. Adoptive mother needs to suckle the child at least five times, and they should be suckled in their first two years, as the Prophet ﷺ mentions here in this particular hadith. Suckling forbids from marriage that which is forbidden due to birth. Once this has been established, the adopted son becomes the mahram for any other relation that a biological son would have. The same rules apply if you adopt a girl. So very, very straightforward, brothers and sisters, when in terms of an adoptive uh, child. As we continue, uh, the social network. This is, this is the ongoing problem, right? Given everything you have just learned, brothers and sisters, what do you think about communication with the opposite gender online? Bear in mind, you are alone and your conversation is private. The inhibitions uh, run low and temptations run high. Shaitan helps you. You know, zina is you know the is not just based on a physical sin. And we talked about this. The Prophet says the eyes they fornicate, the hands they fornicate, that sort of thing. So keep this in mind, brothers and sisters. And remember, social networks. If you want to go on Facebook or you want to go on Twitter or, or whatever, these things in and of themselves are not haram but it can be used for haram and that's what you want to make sure you abstain from. Don't allow yourself to use these things in a haram manner. Um, the next uh, webinar, I think we're coming inshallah close to the end of our discussion. So you guys are doing great mashallah. We're getting a lot of things discussed here alhamdulillah. So let's just summarize some of the points that we looked at today. Islam is a practical religion, leaves no room for gray areas or uncertainty. This is, of course, based on a hadith the Prophet ﷺ says, shubuhat." I warned you of getting into downfall or uncertain areas. In Islam, good and bad deeds are based on both intention and action. So it is not enough to say, I never intended anything bad by this when committing the wrong action. See, they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. An example is grave worshippers have good intentions about their actions, but their actions are totally haram and cannot be justified made right merely by their intentions. So, I mean, even in the same case here, that in a relationship, just because a person is doing, um, is involved in a particular relationship that could be haram, their intention here has to go hand in hand together. Uh, they also have to have good intentions. So, what this tells you, brothers and sisters, is one important thing. A lot of people have this concept that no one knows your sincerity except you and Allah. This is very, very incorrect. It's a very dry way to look at a uh, look at this particular mas'ala. Why? Because we have verses like this. We have verses that teach us and tell us that, wait a minute, you know, if my actions have to reflect my intentions, then that means that if my intention is good, then my actions are going to be good. But if they're bad, my actions are going to be bad. So if I want people to know and see the sincerity in me, then guess how they're going to see it? They don't have to open your heart and look for something. They have to see it through your actions. So this way, brothers and sisters, you can tell when somebody is being sincere based on their actions, based on how they reflect their lifestyle and how they behave. So fear Allah regarding this matter. It is, it is a, slippery, a slippery slope that has led even the most pious men astray and there are very various hadith and um, narrations that are like this. You know, one that really stands out to mind is 
the Prophet ﷺ was standing one day and a man came up to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, I kissed a girl. Now remember, brothers and sisters, there's a couple things to look at when you look at this narration. Number one, this companion came when he kissed the girl, which tells you that this girl that he kissed, he was involved in some kind of relationship with her. So you can't just walk up to a girl and just kiss her and then run away and that's it, you know? So it shows that there was something there that led to him kissing this girl. But what did it for him, the worst that could happen for him is the kissing part. Everything else that he did before that was okay, like in the sense that he didn't see a problem with it. He didn't look at it as a major concern. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard this, you know what he did? He turned his back to this man and walked away. And so the man came and he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I kissed a girl. Is there any chance for me? Is there any repentance for me? And the Prophet ﷺ actually jumped on his camel and he started to ride. And this man held on to the Prophet's camel and the camel was dragging this man. And the man was saying, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, please help me. You know what the Prophet ﷺ is doing here? He's teaching him a lesson. And then eventually the Prophet ﷺ paused and he stopped and then he addressed the man and he advised him to repent and seek tawbah and to stop doing this. So subhanAllah brothers and sisters, just imagine, look at the first reaction the Prophet ﷺ did. To teach this man a lesson, he just completely ignored him. So brothers and sisters, where do, which position do you want to be when you're with the Prophet ﷺ in your deen, in your belief, in your heart, in your lifestyle? Where do you want to be in your legacy, in your lifestyle, in terms of reflecting the lifestyle and the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ? So having said that, brothers and sisters, uh, I want to conclude at least my part of the discussion here by mentioning to you the last point. Beware of your thoughts, for they will become your words. Beware of your words, for they will become your actions. And beware of your actions, for verily they be, will become your habits. And beware of your habits, for they will become your character. And beware of your character, for it will become your destiny. You define yourself based on who you are. Be a good person, be a sincere person, be a wise person, be a devoted individual. Your lifestyle, the legacy, and the destiny that you will have here in this world will reflect just that. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless you all. May Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala keep our relationships as halal as possible. And any one of us who might be, let's be honest with yourself. If you happen to be in a haram relationship, May Allah Azza wa Jal protect you from it and rectify that for you. And remember, keep it halal and get married. So this is your brother Muslih Khan here. Uh, I thank you all for listening, at least uh, for my discussion. Just hang on, inshallah. We're going to do a, a Q&A as well. And I believe um, Sister Arfa, inshallah, will discuss a few points with you, uh, inshallah, before we get into the Q&A discussion. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Jazakumullah khair, Shaykh. Um, that was an absolutely amazing presentation. Alhamdulillah, I'm sure everyone has benefited enormously. And just touching, um, you know, what on on what um, Sheikh Musli has actually uh, talked about in this webinar. It's all about keeping it halal. So we actually have the halal answer for you. So any brother or sister out there who's listening right now and you're thinking, how do I find that practicing brother or sister? How do I find someone in a halal way, in a safe environment, inshallah? Then what we would say to you is, brothers and sisters, please do come and register with purematrimony.com. It is the world's largest Muslim matrimonial website exclusively for practicing Muslims. And, you know, some of our unique features that are included, um, you know, we have private profiles. So, you know, brothers, sisters, we are not able to have any type of window shopping whatsoever. You know, you don't actually exchange photos until you reach a mutual point of compatibility. And Alhamdulillah, you know, every single one of the discussions, um, every single one of the profiles that we have, every single one is monitored by a full team of administrators. Absolutely nothing is left unturned. If we have any problems on the site, Alhamdulillah, you know, we have someone who's there to advise people, who is there to actually talk about these things. And Alhamdulillah, it just makes the whole process so much more easier. 
We also have the only website out there which has fully integrated Wally support. And all this means is that, inshallah, if you want to include your Wali in any of your communications and keep the whole thing halal, then inshallah, you know, we have that facility there so that every single thing is actually, um, all the copy of the messages are sent to the Wali in real time. Um, we also have, a, you know, it's fully Sharia compliant. It is actually endorsed by some of the best Shuyuk in the West. And, you know, on top of all of this, you know, we have an inspiring blog, we have education and awareness. There's just so much that we have to offer. And Alhamdulillah, we have got, on average, three couples a week who are finding their pure match at Pure Matrimony. And as a very special, um, you know, a very special, uh, um, as a very special uh, um, offer for everyone who is on, uh, who wants to join Pure Matrimony for the year, we actually have a massive 50% off for the whole year. So for a full year's um, you know, membership, you can just enter the code webinar event as you see on the screen when you register with Pure Matrimony. And that is www.purematrimony.com. Now I should warn you brothers and sisters that this um, offer is only available for a very limited time. In fact, it will be taken down at midnight tonight. So you've got approximately three to four hours in which to get yourself registered, inshallah. Um, okay, um, we're going to move on to the questions now, and I'm going to start by asking um, some of, we've had lots of questions on this, and we're going to start with a very common one. Um, Sheikh, uh, a sister is asking, can two people who are engaged speak to each other in the presence of a mahram? Okay. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Absolutely, two individuals who are engaged and they have the presence of the mahram who is there, that is the best, best way for two individuals to speak to each other because at least it's safe, it's monitored in to, to at least a certain extent and the possibility of anything haram being discussed or happening is next to zero. So that is the best way, insha'Allah, for two people to engage in a conversation. And, uh, you know, insha'Allah, you know, may Allah Azza wa Jal make it easy for them. Okay, excellent. Jazakumullah khair. Um, okay, next question. Can we talk um, to our colleagues in an office with the opposite sex? Yes, of course. You can talk to your colleagues of the opposite gender. You can talk to anybody of the opposite gender. But as we've emphasized over and over in this webinar, that every single thing has rules behind it. The Sharia permits us to talk to people of the opposite gender when there's a specific reason to do so. So for example, if you want to buy and sell, if you want to do a transaction, if you want to finish an assignment, if you happen to be walking in your office, and you know you have male and female colleagues that are working with you it is permissible for you to work in that environment in the sense that if you need a job to get done get it done if you need to communicate with your boss your manager who's a male or a female then you need to speak to them get the job done the problem is is that if you take these permissible acts and become careless with them a lot of people try to look at this as a black and white issue it's not necessarily that in, in, in and of itself. It's black and white in terms of what is haram is haram, what is halal is halal. You just have to make sure that you follow the guidelines of what it is to be a Muslim. You should know your limits and how much you talk and how much you laugh and how much you smile. And do all of those little things that we discussed in the webinar. As long as you follow that, then insha'Allah ta'ala, it is permissible for you to do that. No. Um, a sister is asking, my mother-in-law gets angry when I don't allow my brother-in-laws into my home, when my husband is not present. Um, how should I handle this situation? So they don't allow your brother-in-laws to get home, to come home unless your husband is present. Yeah. Now, now the issue here is, is it's, it's, it's tricky. Because this is really at the discretion of your brother-in-law. Your brother-in-law should be the one to understand this situation. Now, here you have to use a lot of wisdom. Um, the best advice that I can give you is that if you do happen, for whatever reason, you do have to happen to allow your brother-in-law to come in the home. Let's just say you guys all live together in the same house. 
then try to be secluded from him as best as possible. In other words, try to be in a room by yourself, just close the door and just hang out there until you're done, until um, you, you, your husband comes home. Try to be in the basement or something. The point is just try to be secluded from that as best as you can and only come out if there's an, a reason to do so. Um, you know, that's the best advice that I can give you aside from just trying to talk to the brother-in-law and just let him know, look, just wait inshallah until my husband comes home and then we can do that. Because in and of itself, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that, you know, if you don't want your brother-in-law to be there until the husband comes home or it's not allowed to happen, that's actually a good thing. It's a protection for you. Look at it in a positive light, inshallah. And, then, you know, it's just going to be a, a, a means to protect you and protect your iman. I just want to make one point for the previous question about working in the environment and talking to opposite gender. Just keep in mind that even though we mention all of that, the Prophet ﷺ himself spoke to women. Women would walk right up to him and ask him the most personal and intimate questions ever. They would ask him about you know, their menstruation and all of these things. They would just go right up to him and ask him. And the Prophet ﷺ would respond. But what, what made this so unique is that the Prophet had the best of manners, so he would respond with good manners. He knew his morals, he knew his religion, and he used that, and he would respond, address the issue, and that was the end of it. No. Um, a brother is asking that during work presentations, women often extend their hand to him. What should he do without the risk of offending them? Okay, we discussed this in the webinar about um, anybody who extends their hand and wanting to shake your hand, of course of the opposite gender that's haram for you. We discussed this during the webinar and we mentioned that the first thing that you should do, you should consider is be honest. Be honest and let them know that look, you know, as a Muslim or as part of my religion, I can't do this. 99% of the time, brothers and sisters, believe me, it works. I am no different from any one of you. I'm faced with the same challenges. I go out, I go to a grocery store, I go to offices, I do any, I'm faced with the exact same thing. Every time I do a non-Muslim event and I have to lecture about Islam or something, I have the same issue and it's very, very, alhamdulillah, so far it's been very, very easy where I find myself as long as I'm honest about who I am, about my religion, people respect that. Most of the times when you're honest about who you are and you're proud of your religion, most of the times people respond in a very respectful manner. They understand that. I remember like this is a very similar situation to a person who wants to pray at a workplace but doesn't have the accommodation to do that. And the guy goes up to his boss and says, look, I really need to pray and I really just need two, three minutes to just get my prayer done and I'll be back on the job immediately. Most of the times the boss, you know what he'll do? He might give you his own office and say, here, you can pray in my office. Or he'll provide a room for you and he'll take care of you. You know, mashallah, some of the largest non-Muslim corporations in the world actually have wudu facilities in their offices for the Muslims. So it's something that actually is respected and honored, but you just got to be honest and sincere about it. Well, mashallah, that's an excellent answer. Um, okay, a brother is asking, um, he's basically saying that he's going to be getting married to one of his cousins um, during the summer. However, um, his dilemma is that he used to drink and do drugs, although he has now stopped doing them. He also has, has mentioned that he had an affair with another one of his cousins, which lasted for two years. And now he's extremely worried and he's feeling guilty and he's upset and he's wondering, should he tell his future wife to be? Um, because this is something that he's finding very difficult to come to terms with. Okay, no, he shouldn't have to tell her anything about this unless it has some effect or uh, to the relationship itself. So what do I mean by that? If your future uh, spouse finds out that during the marriage relationship that that person had, for example, committed zina, and he or she finds out that their spouse was not a virgin, that's a big problem. That's something that they should consider communicating at some point in the premarital relationship. Why? Because what kind of position would you put yourself or that person in for them to find out something like that about you? 
and you don't have to spell it out word for word. I am not a virgin. I committed zina. You don't have to do that. You have to be very subtle and very, very, um, you have to use a lot of wisdom in how you want to do this. You know, you can say, look, I've made some major mistakes in the past in, in my life, and I feel really guilty about it, and everybody makes mistakes. I have made mistakes in my life as well, but it's something that I just want to keep between me and Allah. W would this be a problem with for you once we get married? So you can be very subtle on the approach. You don't have to give details about who you are or what, what you've done. However, I am very, very supportive of a situation where if that particular sin or mistake an individual has done is going to affect the relationship between the husband and wife, then by all means, the person, he needs to man up or the woman needs to be honest and explain that, look, I've done this in the past. So for example, suppose one of the parties, they did a sin and they got um, incarcerated for it, so they went to jail. And now as a result, one of the parties has a huge criminal record that's going to be on them for 10, 15 years. And you keep that a secret, and you get married. And now when you get married, you want to start looking for a good job and a good career. But guess what? Nobody wants to hire you because you have a criminal record. And then your wife or your husband suddenly finds out and says, what's this? You have a criminal record? What are you doing? What that does now is that you just created a situation where there's going to be a lack of trust now. There's going to be a lack of communication. There's going to be dishonest issues, blah, blah, blah. It's just going to continue from one thing to another. So you need to really think about what sins and mistakes can actually affect the marriage relationship and come clean about that. Don't have to give any details, but at least be honest and say, look, is this going to be an issue for our relationship or not? And the last thing I want to mention with this question here is, anybody who is faced with this particular situation, find it in your heart to forgive. Find it in your heart to understand that that person has made mistakes and deserves an opportunity to change their life. And perhaps you may be the avenue that that individual may be a great servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. I'm just conscious of the time, so I'm just going to ask two more questions, and then inshallah we will be concluding. Um, so the next question is, we have a family friend who always puts his hand on my head, um, even when I hesitate, and my father says it's okay because he's my uncle, but in actual fact he isn't. Um, I really, really dislike this, and I don't know what to do. What do you advise? First thing, tell your father. Tell your father that you don't like this, and tell your father, if you have to, tell him that this is also haram for you to do this. And you, if you'd like, tell him that you just listened to a webinar by Brother Muslakan, and you can let your father refer to it if he really needs to look at it. The point that I'm making here is, number one, there is no age limit or age barrier when it comes to ilm. So even though he's your father, you still have a right to say something that is halal or something that is haram. You still have that right because that's not a right that he dictates. It's a right that Allah gives you. So if you as the child find something is haram, but the father says it's okay, no big deal, then you have a fundamental right to obey Allah than more so than the Father because there is no obedience to the creation at the cost of disobedience to the Creator. So that's the first thing. Be honest, tell your Father exactly how you feel. The second thing is that if that doesn't work and the Father says, look, he's your, he's your uncle or he's like your uncle and he did this, this, is that, how are you going to do that? You're going to break relationship, it's going to cause a big problem. Then here is where you tell your father to go and, I, I'm gonna, just going to use this lack of a better term, but I'm, you, you tell your father to do the dirty work. In other words, he's your dad, let him go and speak to the uncle in a manner that is respectful, courteous, honest, and let him know that, look, you know, it's his duty to protect his daughter, to protect her, her Islam. It's a right that the daughter or a child has that the parents protect their Islam as well. So let the father go and speak to him and explain to him that, look, you know, my child, 
you know, she's religious now, and you know, it's part of our deen, and you got to respect it. So little things have to change. But we still love you. We still want to be friends. We still want a good relationship. But just, you know, hands off my daughter kind of thing, right? Not in those words, obviously, but just be courteous and honest as best as you can. Yeah. Um, last question. Um, a sister is asking, is it permissible um, to stay in the same house as her sister where she also lives with her husband? Okay, is it permissible for her to stay in the same house with her sister and and she lives with her husband? Yes, the sister lives with yes her husband? So basically okay. it's her husband and wife. Yeah, th it is permissible. Obviously there are going to be certain rules to follow here because you don't want to be alone with anybody at any given time. So as long as you follow those guidelines, it is permissible. Generally speaking, brothers and sisters, there is no you're you're permitted to live with anybody you wish, as long as the certain rules are are, are applied. So, for example, as long as it doesn't have any effect um, towards your deen, there is no shirk and there is no haram things that are being being done or happening within that home. And as long as you yourself are not involved in anything haram or not put put into a haram circumstance, like as long as you follow these particular guidelines, it is permissible. Just for the sister and her husband, you just have to keep in mind, like especially for the husband, that you know he's obviously going to be there, and one of these one of these uh, women are going to be haram for him. So you try to avoid that as best as you can, and inshallah, follow those guidelines. Um, if there are any other questions, inshallah, or concerns, then by all means, you guys can also come and check me out on my fan page um, uh, on, my, on my Facebook account, and I can also try to address some of your questions there, inshallah. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. جزاكم الله خير شيف. Um, so yeah. as Brother Musleh has actually said, you can actually connect with him inshallah on Facebook. Um, it is Brother Dot Musleh um, on Facebook, and inshallah, if you want to get in touch with him via, via his email, Sheikh Musleh, what is your, what is the best email for people to contact you on? Okay, it can it it could be the general email, which is just Musleh Khan. It's all one word at yahoo.com. Okay. Okay. Um, also, I'd like to tell the audience, inshallah, that Sheikh Musa does actually do Q&A every Wednesdays at 6 o'clock GMT time on um, a radio show. It is the Ask Musa Khan show, which is, mashallah, a phenomenal show. Um, and that is if you go to www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Ask Musa uh, Khan, um, and it is actually if you if you look up pure matrimony as well, you'll be able to find the show. Inshallah, keep a look out on our Facebook page for all future details. Um, the radio show details will inshallah be posted up tomorrow. Um, you can connect with us on uh, Facebook. Just go to Pure Matrimony on Facebook, and of course you can also connect with us on Twitter, and all the details are there on screen. Um, Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh. Um, I just want to finally conclude by telling everybody that. For the next webinar, what I would like to do, inshallah, is I would like to request uh, from the audience, please could you tell us what would you like to have? Um, so if you go to our Facebook page or you can contact us on info at purematrimony.com, let us know what, we, what you'd actually like to um, hear. And inshallah, we will definitely try and accommodate. So keep a lookout on the Facebook pages, inshallah, and we will keep you updated there. Um, I just want to conclude by uh, thanking everyone for attending tonight's webinar and most of all thank you to our superb speaker, Sheikh Musla Khan, for his time today. Of course, if you are interested, please take advantage of our exclusive, exclusive offer by signing up to Pure Matrimony using the code Webinar Event. It's all one word in capitals for 50% off for the entire year and that offer does, inshallah, expire tonight at midnight. May Allah make it easy for all of us to find a righteous spouse and perfect half of our being according to the Quran and the Sunnah. I wish you all the very best. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. <laughs>